Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Innovations in Vaccine Research and Development. I am Jennifer Woods of Labroots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Alexandra Sasha Vlasov, Senior Manager, R&D at Thermo Fisher Scientific, Laura Chapman, Staff Scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific, Kettle Peterson, Manager and Staff Scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and Matt McKenna, Senior Field Application Scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Sasha, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I will go through a quick introduction, then hand it over to uh, Laura Ketchel and Matt for the main body of presentation. Uh, many of you know that uh, the story of vaccine development uh, goes back to 1796. Uh, Dr. Jenner and his amazing work and uh, bright discoveries on smallpox. And uh, since then, it's been 220 years of scientific and medical innovation, adventures. There are many stories to tell. And looking back, for me, it's just mind-blowing how much happened in such a relatively short time frame, in particular the last few decades. It was not only about uh, efficient development of vaccines for all key bacterial and viral infections, but also about a wide uh, extent of implementation worldwide. So now we completely eliminated some of the uh, infectious diseases that plagued humanity for many years, uh, but also just many of them are under control. And we have very efficient machinery worldwide to develop new vaccines in very short uh, time frame. Uh, speaking about types of vaccines, now there are different approach how uh, specialists prepare them. Uh, the first one is inactivated vaccines when a pathogen is uh, inactivated by heat, uh, chemical substances or radiation, and then it's safe to administer upon uh, intramuscular injection and uh, enables very efficient vaccination with a short uh, investment in the inactivation vaccine production. Uh, next one is life attenuative vaccines, uh, followed by subunit, recombinant, polysaccharide, and conjugate vaccines. There are taxoid vaccines, pretty recent development. I am personally very passionate and excited about nucleic acid vaccines, which is the latest development. And many of you heard about success stories from Pfizer and Moderna that were uh, among the very first vaccines launched for COVID infection. And they were developed uh, just within about one year of, uh, of research. We can't really say that they were developed from scratch. Uh, mRNA uh, therapeutics and vaccines were already actively explored by scientists over the last five or 10 years. Uh, there were very good modifications already known uh, to stabilize uh, mRNA minimize immune response. There were already very good uh, delivery vehicles explored based on cationic lipids and nanoparticles. But uh, the main effort was aimed at uh, mRNA therapeutic development. And these were efforts by Moderna and several other key companies. So uh, vaccines were de-emphasized. And basically, at the time of pandemic, it was uh, amazing to see that everything happened from the very beginning to finalizing uh, uh, basically vaccine development, launch it, uh, commercialize it, and uh, injecting millions of people worldwide in just one year. Uh, vaccines are developed in a very sophisticated manner, so it's lengthy step-by-step -step process. Uh, uh, the current slide highlights just some of the key steps. Uh, first, uh, target discovery, you need to very uh, efficiently isolate and characterize your pathogen of interest then uh, follows antigen identification, selection, uh, production of antigen. Then there's process and analytical development, clinical studies, which are super important. It all starts with safety. Then there's efficacy studies and uh, long-term effect exploration. And finally, commercial production and uh, mass distribution worldwide, which is a separate big challenge. So you can imagine so that uh, so not only tens of millions of doses of vaccines should be produced every week or every month, but they should be delivered to every corner of the world and uh, safely administered to human subjects. 
a separate challenge in case of COVID vaccine when double injection is required. So it's a logistical nightmare. And it's just really amazing for me to see uh, how efficiently it was all done at the time of COVID pandemic. Uh, vaccine development is a long and sophisticated process that uh, requires many specialized tools and carefully optimized workflows. Uh, Thermo Fish Scientific over the range of years developed all reagents, kits, instruments, solutions, and uh, built expertise to help with vaccine development from the very early stages through launch and mass production. These solutions range, for instance, in case of mRNA vaccine development from NTPs and transcription enzymes to delivery formulations to large-scale production processes to even freezers uh, allowing to store mRNA vaccines at ultra low temperatures. We have all of this in our portfolios. Uh, there are too many products to cover in today's presentation, so we'll be just highlighting the, the critical ones, the selective ones. Laura and Ketchel will be presenting the key products from the sample prep portfolio, kits and reagents uh, for purification of plasmid DNA, genomic DNA, RNA, and some other products, which are extremely useful for development of vaccines. Uh, using all approaches that I mentioned on previous slide, but in particular nucleic acid-based uh, vaccines. Matt will be uh, presenting on XP expression system as a very important tool for vaccine development. Uh, this is introduced on the current slide. Uh, protein expression is the method of producing uh, proteins using cell lines. Uh, we develop a fantastic system that allows to obtain large amounts of protein to study its functional structure or use in uh, vaccine development purposes, especially for production of recombinant vaccines. So this is a very exciting uh, application. Uh, as you all know, the last uh, probably year and a half, uh, the entire scientific and medical community worldwide, so all academic organizations, biotech, pharma, medical research centers, they were solely focusing on coronavirus uh, uh, research and uh, everyone abandoned all other topics. And uh, it was uh, really impressive to see how rapidly coronavirus was characterized from a basic research standpoint. So basically, what is the composition of this virus? How exactly it enters cells? How it multiplies in Side, how it's spreading uh, throughout the body, how it's transferred from one human subject to another. And at the same time, it was uh, very interesting to see uh, the very rapid and very efficient, uh, basically, uh, solution for uh, eradication of this problem worldwide. And there are many different organizations that attacked it from different angles, uh, many examples of brilliant collaboration and amazing solutions launched in an extremely short time frame. Uh, Speaking about new vaccine development, the process usually takes five years. Uh, in some cases, for truly new vaccines, it could be longer. Uh, it's step-by-step -step process. There are good reasons why exactly this process evolved and there, why there are certain checkpoints, certain uh, areas uh, of research they take a certain number of time. But at the desperate time of pandemics, of course, all of these rules were broken and the new scheme emerged that allowed to dramatically uh, accelerate the vaccine development process from five plus years to just one year or less. Uh, we are really excited about this latest break breakthroughs in uh, vaccine development. Uh, it was very impressive to witness how uh, COVID molecular diagnostics emerged first in the early days of pandemic, and we were a big part of this uh, development. And then vaccines and therapies candidates, which are the ultimate solution, obviously, um, emerged within just one year since the beginning of coronavirus outbreak. Uh, we closely worked uh, all this time with Pfizer, Moderna, and uh, other companies that already launched vaccines, as well as many other organizations worldwide that are at the early phase of discovery and vaccine development. Uh, our goal overall is to uh, develop innovative next-gen solutions and keep supporting everyone with their research and uh, manufacturing needs when it comes to molecular diagnostic vaccine development and therapies. It's a truly exciting time for us. Really impressive to see what happened in the last year. Uh, and I'm uh, now passing the presentation over to Laura Chapman. Okay, thank you, Sasha. Um, all right. So as Sasha mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about some of the um, solutions that we offer from Thermo Fisher for uh, sample prep. And um, Sample prep we refer to as the extraction of RNA or DNA from a sample type or even proteins. I'm going to be focusing on RNA and DNA extraction. So um, just to kind of give a high-level overview of what we refer to as sample prep, 
in a nutshell, is any kind of sample that you may be working with that you would like to extract the RNA or DNA out of. Um, and there's a variety of different methods that you can use to extract the RNA and DNA. Um, and then you would choose those different methods depending on um, the, the, your outcome that you want, um, whether it be your downstream application or the analyte that you're interested in. So I want to talk a little bit more in detail about some of these methods. In general, there are three basic types of methods to uh, prepare your RNA or DNA for analysis. The first one is the gold standard of um, phenol-based extraction or trizol um, that we offer from Thermo Fisher. This is by far like the highest purity and the gold standard for um, extracting RNA and DNA. It will work with pretty much any sample type and you're guaranteed to get high quality um, nucleic acid from it. The challenge comes in that it's um, low throughput, it's very hands-on, it's not very um, adaptable for using it for multiple samples. Um, and then the other problem is that it is um, highly toxic reagents that are, that are being used in the process, but you get high quality reagents or high quality um, nucleic acid. The other option that you can use for uh, purifying your RNA or DNA is a solid phase extraction, something using like our PureLink um, uh, column-based kits or our MagMax bead-based kits. With these, both of, the, uh, both of them work with a similar concept in the fact that the RNA or DNA is bound to the solid phase in the column example, it would be the, the membranes that are at the bottom of the column, and then with the bead-based extraction kits, it's bound to the beads, you would wash in a loop and then be able to use it in your downstream application. The benefit of this is that it's much more high throughput than Trizol. Um, it um, can be automated for the bead-based ones. You can use our Kingfisher um, to be able to automate that, um, make it a little bit easier to process up to 96 samples at a time. And then lastly is um, just preparing a, a crude lysate that can go directly into QRT-PCR uh, for your downstream gene expression analysis. Um, an example of this is our cells to CT product line. And so the benefit of this is that it's very high throughput. You only need to lyse and then add a, um, a stop solution. So the sample cup takes less than 10 minutes for a 96 well plate, uh, but you don't have the purity there. So if you need to do other downstream applications such as sequencing, this may not be the best fit, um, but it's perfect for QRT-PCR analysis. One of our kits that I wanted to highlight just because of um, its growing um, use in the in the world of uh, diagnostic, or not necessarily diagnostic, but for biomarker um, detection. So um, with this kit, it's our MagMax cell-free total nucleic acid kit. The benefit of this kit is that it extracts cell-free DNA that's free-floating within a liquid biopsy. A liquid biopsy is a emerging sample type and an emerging diagnostic tool because um, it's much easier to obtain than a, a traditional biopsy. So you could take a portion of blood or urine or sputum or saliva or some other um, liquid from, um, from a person and be able to look for biomarkers that could help look for diseases. So this kit that we offer works really well. Um, and the example shown in the data here is looking at a bioanalyzer trace of cell-free nucleic acid. So cell-free DNA and RNA is it's very small. Um, the little tiny blip that you can see on the trace on the day ones at the um, on the baseline, that is your cell-free DNA. So it's about 140 base pairs on average. Um, and so it's quite small and it's very minimal for the amount of DNA and RNA that's, uh, that's cell-free within your samples. Um, and then here we're comparing with two different collection tubes, the STREC tubes, which are, um, the benefit of that is that it is specifically designed for cell-free DNA, and so it prevents you from extracting uh, genomic DNA, which can be a contaminant um, whenever you're looking for cell-free DNA. And so you can see in day 14, there's a, a bigger hump down at the end. That's the genomic DNA, um, but with the struct tubes, that's much smaller than with just the K2 EDTA tubes. Um, so if you are looking um, for cell-free DNA tools, uh, the struct tubes work really well. They work well with our MagMax um, cell-free DNA kit. Um, and then the other benefit of the kit is that it also um, works better with not getting the genomic DNA. So some of the competitor kits, you get a little bit more genomic DNA, which can be difficult whenever you're doing your um, sequencing downstream. Uh, it can prevent you from getting the read depth that you would want for your um, cell-free DNA. 
Another tool that I wanted to highlight is the um, cells to CT kits. So the benefit of these, as I mentioned um, with the extraction protocol, is that it, it's actually not an extraction. It's just a lysis-based kit um, so that you can just slice your sample and go directly into your qPCR. The benefit of this is that it's really beneficial for um, high throughput screening. So if you are maybe doing transfections of plasmids and you want to see the expression levels, make sure that the RNA is being expressed, um, you could quickly do a screening using the cells to CT kit that will allow you to lyse the cells and then go directly into qPCR and look for your target gene of interest without having to isolate the RNA and go through the um, process of purifying your RNA or DNA. So as I mentioned, it's only a seven minute sample prep. Um, it does, um, you just add the lysis buffer, let it sit for uh, five minutes, then add your stop buffer, let it sit for two minutes, and then it can go directly into your RT, qPCR, and we have options for one step and two step. So if you're doing a screening, um, especially a gene expression screening, this would be really great. Um, and for example, if it was like the, the um, plasmids, then you would be able to look for that expression to make sure it's expressing what you want it to before going on to your next level. The next kit I would like to highlight is our um, microbial um, workflows. So we have three different kits that are offered to look for ma uh, microbial and pathogens. So we have the MagMax viral pathogen, and then the next version is the MagMax viral pathogen ultra, and then the MagMax microbiome ultra. So the viral pathogen kit is our core kit. Um, it's a, um, really easy to use, um, only takes about 20, 25 minutes on the Kingfisher Flex to be able to isolate viral um, nucleic acids from your samples. This was widely used um, during the pandemic to be able to isolate the RNA from BTM samples that were collected from nasal swabs. And then more recently with saliva samples that were collected, it also works with those. Um, and so it's been a great tool um, during the pandemic to be able to detect and um, notify people that they have that they have the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, the next version is the Ultra, and the difference there is that it has an extra tube of enzyme mix that helps slice the more difficult to lice, um, like gram-positive bacteria, fungi, those kind of things that are more challenging to lice. It has an extra set of enzymes to help you lice those uh, more efficiently. And then lastly is the Microbiome Ultra Kit. So this is um, still uses uh, the core reagents for the lysis and wash. Um, but this one is specifically used for like stool samples or wastewater samples so that you can um, look at the different um, pathogens and microbes that are within um, a person's microbiome. The next set of kits I wanted to speak to is our plasma DNA applications. And so these are especially beneficial uh, to vaccine development, um, especially for the, the mRNA vaccines. So generally, the, um, you would start with your plasma and do an IVT reaction to get your, your mRNA, and then that was, is what is used in the uh, vaccines. And so you would need to start with high-quality plasma DNA. And so there are three basic types of plasma DNA uh, extraction kits for different uses. Um, the first one is a molecular-grade one. So this is where you just want to check the sequence of it. You want to do molecular applications. Um, you don't need to do transfections or um, or any kind of in vitro work. The next is transfection grade, um, hence the name. It's, due, it's um, mostly used for transfection, so it's a little bit uh, better purity, um, so that it doesn't have any down, um, it doesn't have side effects to your cells or cause cytotoxicity whenever you transfect. So it's a cleaner prep, um, and it provides you really high quality DNA to use in your transfections. And then the third uh, quality of plasma DNA extraction kits that we have is the advanced transfection. Um, and this is for your gene therapy and for vaccine development. So it's the purest of, of plasma prep kits that you can get um, to make sure that you have really clean DNA before you're using it in um, a gene therapy or vaccine setting. So one kit that we um, that's fairly new uh, that we offer for the molecular grade. So this would be for your initial starting point when you're looking at plasmids for vaccine development. You want to make sure that you have the right maybe gene um, section in your plasmid. You would use this molecular version for a quick screening. 
um, is the PureLink Fast Flow Endotoxin Plasma Kit. The benefit of this kit is that um, it has colored buffers, so it makes it really easy to know which buffer you're grabbing. You don't have to you know, be so um, meticulous in reading the label. You can just look for the blue buffer or the pink buffer, um, which makes it a little bit easier to work with. Um, but it's very quick. It only takes about 30 minutes to completely um, do a maxi prep for isolating um, up to 1.5 milligrams of plasma DNA. And it's also actually um, quite clean as well. You get low endotoxin. It's not endotoxin free, but it's still quite clean for such a quick uh, plasma prep. This is some example data from uh, using the PureLink Fast Flow Endotoxin Kit as compared to a couple of other kits. Uh, the PureLink Fast is in the dark red. Um, so this is the total yield that we received from a maxi kit as compared to uh, a competitor kit and then one of our other um, internal kits, the PureLink High Pure. So the FAST kit actually provides um, equivalent quality plasma DNA as shown in the gel picture, but it's, um, it, you get more, more yield out of it, which is uh, the benefit of using the, the, this particular kit. The next level of um, that I wanted to talk about for plasma DNA is the advanced tra transfection uh, plasma DNA. And so this is using our PureLink XB endotoxin-free plasma kits. So these isolate, again, up to 1.5 milligrams of high-quality plasma DNA from a maxi prep kit. Um, but here, these are endotoxin-free. And we, just, we determined um, endotoxin-free as if it has less than uh, 0.1 endotoxin units per microgram of DNA. Um, and so it's beneficial for use in uh, plants, uh, excuse me, in transfections and for vaccine development, for gene therapy, um, some of the, um, you know, uh, more challenging uh, plasmid uses. Um, this was where you would want to use this kit because it's very clean, um, very high quality DNA to be able to use in those downstream applications. And then again, this is some example data from the, um, that kit using either the Maxi, the Mega, or the Giga. We have all three scales available. So initially, you may want to start out with just the Maxi kit so that you can do um, a look-see to how well it's working. Um, and then whenever you realize that this is the plasma that we want to move forward with for you know, maybe your vaccine development, um, you would scale up and go to the Mega and Giga scale so that you can get more of that plasma to be able to work with. And here in these graphs, we are comparing it to one of our competitor kits um, that actually uses gravity column. The benefit of the PureLink XB kit is that it uses vacuum manifolds to um, clarify and bind and elute um, the um, plasma DNA. So it's much quicker workflow than the gravity flow columns that you might get from other companies. Um, and then, as you can see here, the red bars show the PureLink XB kit yield compared to the gravity columns in the blue. So you get quite a bit more um, for all three scales if you use the PureLink XB kit. And this is again is um, using the PureLink XB kit and the um, and showing compatibility with the transient expression system. And Matt will talk a little bit more about this later on about what the um, expression system is. But it's a, um, a it's a kit that's entirely comprised of everything that you would need to be able to do expression from a plasmid um, into uh, getting that ex um, protein expression. And so here you can see that compared to um, competitor kits, we get equivalent or better results uh, for the expression of the XB293 or the XB Cho system. And then this is another experiment showing the uh, performance of the plasma that you would get from the PureLink XB, um, the endotoxin-free kit. Here what we did was uh, ran a gel just to show that you get um, equivalent um, banding patterns with the PureLink kits, which are the lanes marked 1, 2, and 3 as compared to a competitor kit that's labeled Q1 and Q2. So um, even though the XB kit uses the uh, vacuum manifolds to speed up the process, you get equivalent quality as compared to the gravity flow through uh, columns. And it happens in a much quicker uh, turnaround time. 
The second graph shows the yield that you would get, um, as well as the time cha time savings that you get. So the pure link, you get um, a little bit more than four and a half uh, milligrams of yield, whereas with the competitor, it's um, about three, and it takes half the time as it does with the competitor because, of, as I mentioned, it uses the vacuum manifold compared to the gravity flow. And then those same um, plasmids were done into a transfection of HeLa cells just to show how well they would transfect. And um, you get equivalent expression of, this was using um, luciferase. So you get express, equivalent expression of the luciferase um, with um, all the replicates that you get from the PureLink kit, as, which are labeled the PL1, 2, and 3. Those are the PureLink kits as compared to the competitor Q1 and Q2. And then the negative control there just shows that there's um, no background. And so those are the, um, the highlights of some of our portfolio for sample prep products um, that could be helpful in the vaccine um, research and vaccine development. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to add them into the chat. And with that, I will pass it over um, to our next speaker, who is Kettle. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks a lot. Um, and that brings us over to um, the, the intact virus uh, and how to isolate um, the intact virus. So now I've been addressing the nucleic acids, uh, so, so the genome of the virus. And now I will um, talk a little bit about uh, how to uh, enrich and isolate the intact uh, virus uh, by the use of our newly launched product. Uh, so these two new products, they actually have the capability to gener generically capture uh, the virus for uh, which they can then be used for further uh, characterization uh, of the virus itself, but also to study viral host interactions or even also uh, development and testing of drugs uh, and vaccines uh, at different uh, biosafety levels. So typically the starting material for a viral sample preparation is either viral transport media um, or also from cell culture media where you have grown your cells, infected cells releasing uh, virus particles into the media, but also from a wastewater. So the two new products that we have just launched, uh, one is based upon magnetic beads. Uh, they are the DynaBeads. Uh, and the one is uh, the other one is based upon precipitation. So in this way, it's possible to quickly enrich the virus in a generic way. So we're not targeting any surface markers of the virus uh, at all. And also, since the uh, one of those products are magnetic beads, they can of course be uh, the whole workflow can then be automated. So you can automate the virus isolation using the Kingfisher uh, platform. Uh, and those captured uh, intact viruses are then suitable for a different, uh, a range of different downstream applications, uh, such as further virus culture to produce more virus for distribution uh, or for functional studies, uh, basic research work around vaccine development, but also for uh, wastewater surveillance, uh, and not to forget proteomics uh, and, and, and genomics. So uh, in terms of uh, viral enrichment, so what kind of methods are, are commonly used uh, to, to isolate these 100 nanometer sized vesicles? So, so we are not talking about structures that are in the range of, of also on, on exosomes. Uh, there are several methods or, or principles used uh, are, that are commonly used for enrichment uh, and, and isolation. And those are based upon charge. So some of them are using filtration, uh, but there are also different forms of ultracentrifugation uh, and gradient, uh, sucrose gradient uh, centrifugation that are typically used. And not to forget the, uh, the precipitation. But all these methods, they do face uh, different challenges. And I've just mentioned uh, a comparison here uh, in terms of yield. So how much virus can you get out uh, using uh, these common um, 
uh, enrichment methods. Uh, and typically here we see that, uh, for instance, ultracentrifugation uh, can cause a huge loss of samples during the, uh, the uh, sample preparation. Um, So when we developed the, our new two new products for for capturing the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we did use both virus-like particles, which are particles that does not contain any nucleic acids at all. So then you can work on this uh, in a BSL-1 facility. And we also used inactivated or heat inactivated SARS-CoV-2 virus as a model system, uh, as we can use this inactivated virus also in our facility. But of course, we have also tested these two products uh, at the BSL-3 facility, isolating intact and infectious uh, virus, just to make sure to demonstrate that, that these two products can, can um, isolate uh, the infectious virus as well. And also to demonstrate that after isolation, the virus are still infectious. So, so these two products will then capture the virus that uh, is in the viral transport media or uh, in the wastewater, or it will also isolate the viruses that have been released into the cell culture media from the infected uh, target uh, infected cells so allowing for a very rapid capture uh, of these viruses that are suitable for for any downstream application and they can also then as i will show you some data in the end they are um, can then be used upstream uh, the magmax uh, magmax kit So how does these two new products actually work? Okay, let's let's have a look at the DynaBeads first. So these are magnetic beads that you can use for automation. So you can use an automated platform, a bead mover that will do the whole protocol for you. Uh, these beads here are a strong anion exchange beads. So they are positively charged beads that are surrounded with a protective layer of chloride ions. And those uh, negatively charged ions then will then be replaced uh, by the negatively charged virus. And this binding kinetics is super fast. So we actually have a protocol that allows for capture within minutes. Uh, I think the, total, the overall protocol time is around 20 minutes. Uh, it can possibly be a lot shorter uh, than that as well. Uh, and also interestingly, if you add a, a counter ion, a negatively charged counter ion that has stronger affinity than the virus, then you can also uh, release the virus from the beads uh, after, after capture. And the virus will still be infectious. So this allows for numerous uh, downstream uh, applications, wastewater testing, but also functional assays uh, and not to forget the nucleic acid applications. Uh, the other product uh, is based upon precipitation. So you're actually removing water uh, from the surroundings and then collapsing the, the, the viruses uh, uh, into the bottom uh, of the tube. So this is also a very efficient uh, pre -enrich uh, an enrichment uh, of, of these viruses, which are uh, and, and those uh, viruses are then suitable for also for this for the same downstream uh, application. Obviously, since there's no uh, magnetic beads involved in this product, uh, automation is not an option for for these uh, for this method. Okay, so so then I will share with you some data that we have obtained during product development. So in these data sets here, we have spiked in virus-like particles into uh, cell culture media and viral transport media. And then we have captured 
the virus by using uh, these dynabeats, the strong anion ex exchange beads. Uh, and we have used both a manual, uh, a manual protocol, but also uh, the protocol that we have optimized and fine-tuned on the Kingfisher instrument. And actually, we have tested it on all the different instruments that we offer. The Apex, which are, uh, which is the, uh, a brand new uh, instrument that have been launched uh, just uh, uh, some months ago, and then we have the the Flex instrument, but also the tiny little duo prime instrument which uh, i really appreciate because it helps us also <laughs> in in our product development a uh, very uh, nice little instrument uh, but here we, we have demonstrated the isolation efficiency so now we're talking about a protocol that are 20 minutes uh, all in all uh, capturing the virus and we can see the capture efficiency here uh, on the western blots um, where we have identify the nucleocapsid protein as a as a marker for for the virus so the capture efficiency is equally as good in in viral transport media but also in cell culture cell culture media uh, and uh, the data does not demonstrate the uh, manual versus uh, automated but i can assure you that uh, that uh, these are exactly the same uh, and not to forget uh, of course the um, downstream uh, qPCR so we have repeated those experiments testing uh, several different uh, batches of these uh, strong anion exchange beads uh, captured the virus from viral transport media or cell culture media and then process them uh, using um, using the mfb2 kit downstream um, the uh, bead based isolation and then um, identified uh, the structural genes, the N gene, S gene, but also the non-structural or one A B uh, gene uh, by uh, qPCR. Very, very efficient. Uh, and also the second product. Uh, this is the non-bead based product, so it's the precipitation product. Uh, works equally well uh, as the as the dynabeads. Uh, uh, the, the the magnetic bead based uh, isolation. Uh, so just by precipitating out the virus and then followed by by uh, the MVP2 kit and the um, uh, qPCR um, identifying uh, the N gene and the S gene and the non structural ORF1 AB gene. So here we have tested also different uh, batches of uh, of these precipitation reagents, showing very good performance. Uh, and then this is also um, at the protein level, um, where we have tested a, a range of, of different uh, lots here, where we have precipitated out the, the virus uh, and, and detected the nucleocapsid protein uh, from, uh, from viral transport media, but also for, for cell uh, culture media. So in this uh, particular experiments, we have used the viral transport media for this. So, so to sum up, we have two very nice products uh, that can capture intact virus. It can capture intact uh, infectious virus. These are the data that have not shown here, uh, which have been processed in the BSL3 lab, where we have captured the virus with these two products and then um, seeded those virus out uh, in a plaque assay uh, and then counted plaques as a measure of number of infectious particles and that really bypassed the uh, the, uh, the centrifugation approach uh, uh, by a large um, so, so it, the isolation efficiency was a lot higher for the for the bead based precipitation based versus the ultra centrifugation based uh, method so uh, all in all we i think we can say that we have uh, two pretty very pretty good products uh, for isolation of intact uh, viral particles. And with this, I would like to hand it over to, uh, to uh, Matt. Thanks, Carol. Is 
thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, harnessing the, the power of our XB expression systems in, in vaccine development. Lost the ability to advance slides. Um, so we always start off with the, the central dogma. What is protein expression? Um, protein expression is the method of producing uh, proteins using our cell lines. We're um, using the, our cells as factories um, in order to produce some proteins. Um, we're, you know, in this case, we're starting with plasma DNA, um, going through transcription into a messenger RNA, translation into uh, the expression of our, our protein. In this case, the end protein that specifically is the, the spike protein on SARS-CoV-2. Are these slides advancing for people? As Sasha mentioned before, um, there are two Sorry, I'm getting. How's that look? Thank you. Sorry. Um, so there are two methods for uh, expressing proteins. Uh, you can do so in a, a transient fashion or a stable fashion. Um, and the method that you choose um, has a lot of factors that, that go into that decision. Um, the amount of protein that you need, the um, speed to protein is also very important, and how many proteins you need to express. Um, in the, the shortest amount of time. Um, with a, a transient expression, you can you know, scramble through numerous hundreds and thousands of, of proteins in a very short amount of time. You know, within four to 12 days, you can um, go from a, a glycerol stock or purified plasma DNA to your purified protein. And so um, that ability to, to get to the, your protein as, as quickly as possible is a major factor in, in determining what method that you use. Traditionally, once you've identified uh, a certain protein, um, you want to scale up and um, increase the, the uniformity of that, that protein, its, its profile, its, its um, effectiveness of, um, of your therapeutic um, for, for this instance. Um, but this is gonna take months, if not, um, you know, if not years in some cases, to develop that, that stable expression cell line um, to uh, obtain you know, large amounts of protein um, for, for scale up. So when specifically thinking about what are the needs of a vaccine researcher, um, the ability to get to the highest amount of protein in the shortest amount of time is a, a major determining factor. Um, it needs to be scalable, um, your process needs to be cost effective, and it needs to be efficient. Um, to get to those large scale uh, production capabilities. If um, things look good on the research and development end of your workflow, they need to um, look good at the, the, the tail end of your workflow when you're going into manufacturing and commercialization. Otherwise, you're without a product. Here at Thermo Fisher, we have our GIBCO solutions for protein expression, the XB um, cell lines for, for protein expression. Um, when focusing on mammalian protein expression, we have the XB293 and the XB Cho systems. Um, they're great for obtaining a large amount of protein in a, a short amount of time. Um, specifically, when focused on the XB293 system, they can uh, express a, a wide range of, of proteins and protein formats um, in a short amount of time. Um, the XBCHO system is fantastic for excreting um, or expressing secreted protein, um, antibodies, FC, fusions, uh, FAVs, bispecifics, and multispecifics. When focusing on uh, an insect-based cell line, our XBSF system is a SF9-based cell line that has uh, one cell line for the generation of your baclovirus um, straight through the production of your protein in a fully chemically defined animal origin, animal origin free and distillate free um, media. With the XB systems, we take a kit based approach. So this eliminates the, the guesswork of pairing different cell lines with different medias, with different feeds, with different enhancers and different DNA vectors. We take that um, years of research and development out of your hands um, and present you with the XB um, solutions, the XB293, XB Cho, and XBSF for your protein production needs. 
when specifically looking at the vaccine development workflow, these XP systems can support um, your research from the R&D and preclinical stages straight through clinical um, and manufacturing stages. We have both um, RUO versions of the cells and also and uh, GMP banked um, cell lines for um, that ultimate um, commercialization and clinical manufacturing of your product. And with the ability of the XV CHO system, you can now get in show and stay in show, as we like to say. So, so the proteins that you express in a transient fashion will be uh, will have the same qualities of uh, your proteins expressed in a, a stable fashion in that XV CHO system. So you can get a nice early look um, and a, a quick um, quick early look of your your protein in a transient setting, and then progress into a, a stable cell line, knowing that those characteristics aren't going to change. Um, in addition to uh, the vaccine development um, support that our XP systems have been able to provide, we've also supported um, the, the diagnostic use in serological assays. So um, specifically the um, RDT test or the rapid diagnostic test, which is that lateral flow ELISA, that quick and sometimes dirty um, lateral flow ELISA that can um, quickly sometimes accurately, sometimes not accurately, determine if a, a patient um, is testing positive for, for COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, um, with a, a look at um, you know, testing for the, the patient's antibodies um, in that lateral flow assay. Um, the neutralization assay is another assay that we've been able to support with our, our different cell lines. Um, this test relies on uh, the uh, patient antibodies to the detect uh, the level of efficacy in, in a lab setting of those um, antibodies against uh, either a pseudovirus or a live uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's able to um, also be a, a quantitative, um, uh, a quantitative uh, assay, and so it, it can tell you the effectiveness and, and the different dosing strategies or titration strategies of your, um, of your antibodies. And ultimately, um, and finally, the, we like to focus on the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay or the ELISA. Uh, this test can also be qualitative or quantitative, um, and it relies on a, a plate based format to uh, screen uh, antibodies against um, the spike protein and the RBD. In the context of, of COVID 19, these tests are most frequently used to test the patient's uh, IgG and IgG. IgM um, antibodies, the presence of IgG and IgM antibodies. Um, here we like to focus on um, the Kramer serological ELISA protocol. Um, Florian Kramer is a researcher at the ICON School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, and early on in the pandemic, he uh, released a, a, a protocol detailing his use of the XB293 system to produce the RBD and spike proteins um, to support uh, the serological um, assay or ELISA that he, he developed. This is a, a two-part screen. Um, initially, uh, the patient samples are screened against um, the RBD, um, the receptor binding domain portion of the, the full length spike, and then um, confirmed, uh, based, uh, com confirmed with a, a binding to the, the spike, uh, full length spike protein. Um, once again, in a, a, a plate-based format, so 96 well or 384 well um, fashion. So it's a, a pretty rapid screen and very accurate. Um, so it can also um, um, be used to diagnose asymptomatic uh, patients um, that are, are uh, positive for, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, this has been a very popular protocol, and um, he's shared it very widely around the world. Um, so it's been very fortunate to um, be able to support the, the use of XB293 um, in this, this pursuit and, and development of the serological ELISA protocol. Um, here at uh, Thermo Fisher, we like to say we are one Thermo Fisher um, for your vaccine um, development solutions. Um, as uh, the previous presenters have uh, mentioned, we have uh, a ton of different products that can support every aspect of your workflow and your, your development of vaccines um, from the early stages in, in R&D support straight through your clinical manufacturing and clinical services. Um, 
with that, I think we can open it up to questions. All right. Well, thank you, Sasha, Laura, Kettle, and Matt for your informative presentation. We will now start the portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located in the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Uh, speakers, do you want to come back on camera? There we go. Okay, I will start out here. Our first question is, what is the advantage of mRNA vaccines over other vaccine types? If, you may want to unmute yourself if you're talking. There's so many buttons, I know. It's a... There we go, I think I can hear you. No? Sasha, we can't hear you. There you go. Oh, this is Matt. Oh, this is Matt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, what leaps out and jumps to mind is the, the speed um, to, of that um, development of that vaccine. Um, and it's going to be much quicker than the development of, say, a subunit vaccine or a live attenuated um, vaccine. So, as Sasha mentioned before, that, that, um, that shift, that paradigm shift from um, the subunit or live attenuated vaccines to uh, the messenger RNA vaccine development was, you know, it took months or weeks instead of decades. Right. right. It was really fast. Thank you, Matt. Anybody else want to add to that? I'll move on to the next question. Does, uh, does in RNA distraction the lysis method affect the RIN value. Also, in order to increase concentration of RNA, what all conditions should be maintained? I'll take that one. Um, so yes, the, the lysis method does affect the RIN value. Um, so the RIN is your um, integrity number. For those that may not be familiar, it's your RNA integrity number. And so how you lyse your sample um, definitely affects that. Um, so you want to you want to lyse it fairly quickly in a lysis buffer that's going to stabilize your RNA and also inactivate RNases. So most of your commercially available kits are going to have a lysis buffer that will do that. You could use Trizol, you could use like the PureLink kits, the MagMac kits, kits that I mentioned earlier. All of those will have a lysis buffer that will do that. Um, some things that you might want to um, keep in mind is if the sample, like if it's a piece of tissue that's frozen. You generally don't want to thaw that before lysing it because that will allow the RNAs to activate and then degrade your RNA. So you'll want to um, drop the piece of tissue into the um, lysis buffer and homogenize it um, while it's still frozen. We typically use um, a polytron, which is kind of like an immersion blender um, to do that for frozen pieces of tissue because that's going to um, be the easiest way to do that. A mortar and pestle will also work if you have that available. Um, and the other part of that question for um, how can you increase your concentration of RNA, the biggest thing is, is just scale. So um, um, you want to um, lyse in an appropriate volume. Um, the kits generally will provide a, a lysis volume for your sample size volume. So you'll want to follow that protocol um, and follow those recommendations for how much lysis buffer to use per your sample size. Um, and then also you can try to um, decrease your elution buffer depending on what uh, kit you're using. There are also some kits that are for um, small, like if it's a really small sample size, a uh, really small piece of tissue or a small number of cells, um, you can use a kit that's specifically designed for that so that it will maximize your concentration. So those, were the, those are the, um, the things that I would suggest. All right, thank you. Looks like we lost a few, but they may be logging back in so they can um, 
connect their audio. So I will go ahead and ask another question. And if we need to move on, if someone else needs to answer this, we can do that. So the question is, what type, what kind of vaccine is the is easier than the other types to prepare? I think that kind of goes back to what Matt mentioned earlier is the mRNA vaccines are generally a little bit easier, uh, faster at least, um, to make. Um, for some of the attenuated viruses, you know, you have to have the whole virus and inactivate it somehow before you can go into the uh, vaccine. So um, I think the mRNAs are going to be easier. I think they might move to be the primary type of vaccine in the future. Um, but that's, you know, we'll just have to see how it goes and what people are comfortable with. Thank you. Uh, okay, we'll go ahead and we'll just keep asking questions and hopefully they'll pop back in. Can the XB293 and the XBCHO, I may be saying that wrong and I apologize if I am, cell lines be used to produce stable cell lines expressing a protein of interest? I can take that one. Uh, yes, um, it's going to be based on your vector of choice and uh, the selection marker that you uh, include in that uh, vector. And then you can stably select those, those cell lines expressing your protein based on that um, antibody uh, resistance that's uh, included in that, that vector for the, for the stable um, integration of the genome of the, the cell. Yes. All right. Thank you, Matt. We have another question. Are you aware of any publications that optimize the Kramer serological assay and or any that compare and contrast RBD and spike protein expression in XB293 and XBCHO? Yes, uh, we have a, a fantastic publication hub of uh, highlighting the, the use of XB systems for, for vaccine development, um, including a, a nice paper from Dom Esposito at the Frederick National Cancer Lab, um, where he optimized for and Kramer's protocol to increase um, the spike level and RBD level of uh, protein expression. Um, and yes, also in that publication hub, um, there's a, another paper um, out of Albert Einstein um, highlighting the, the use of XBCHO and XB293 for the production of the RBD and spike protein. Can I pop that in the chat? Sure. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Can you, and you that, can you hear us or if not? I can hear you now, yes. That's fantastic. I'm not sure what happens. <laughs> so I can briefly add to some of the early questions about advantages of mRNA. So first of all, it doesn't affect our DNA in any way. It's a very safe approach to use. Then uh, mRNA is easier than DNA to deliver uh, inside cells upon the in vivo injection. So the goal is to deliver the cargo to the cytoplasm. And it's much easier accomplishment versus trying to deliver something into nucleus. And the finally, so with mRNA, so the, the beauty of it is that the antigen is amplified. So when you introduce uh, even one molecule of mRNA inside cells, uh, many molecules of protein can be produced from it in course of process called uh, the transcription or the translation. Then. So compared to protein, where you need to deliver several molecules of antigen, which is like more complicated. So the mRNA allows you to amplify the signal and produce more antigens uh, inside the living body. And which vaccine is easier to uh, just prepare than others? It's a, it's a tough question. So uh, inactivated and live attenuated vaccines, they're easier to prepare. And that's why they were used historically in the early days of vaccine development. But they are, so the process is not so well controlled and it's kind of tricky and it's an old school method. So if you're in a hurry, so definitely it's something worth considering. Modern day vaccines, many of them are subunit and recombinant, which take time uh, and it's an art. So, so it's not a guaranteed success. So these are more complicated ones. And the main excitement right now is all about mRNA, as uh, Matt and Laura says. So this seems to be the uh, really revolutionary technology going way further than just vaccine applications into mRNA therapeutic area. There are currently several uh, companies, including Moderna, driving this development, and they're amazing, uh, making amazing progress right now. So the, the first success story was COVID vaccine, but now there are several other vaccines and uh, therapeutic candidates in their pipeline already in the latest stages. So the, the world, as we know it, hopefully will change in the next one or two years, and it will be a totally new era for vaccine development, which is like, really exciting. Thank you, Sasha. I'm so glad we have you back. Okay, I'm gonna. I really only have time for about one more question here. So, um, 
Can the microbiome kit be used for wastewater samples? I'll answer that one. Um, yes, we actually um, have gotten a lot of inquiries about this because a lot of people are using wastewater as a uh, kind of a surveillance tool for looking to see if there are hot spots for um, SARS-CoV-2 um, virus within the community. And so there is um, an application note that one of our colleagues wrote and put together um, and uh, Kettle mentioned it as well. Um, so there is an application note on the Thermo Fisher website that talks about how you can use it, but you can use the microbiome kit um, with wastewater samples. And if you're using a small volume, like one milliliter, you can use it directly um, using the microbiome kit with the one milliliter of wastewater as your sample type. Um, and if you're using a larger volume, the app note has a protocol for how to concentrate that so that you can use up to, I believe it's up to 50 milliliters of wastewater. All right, thank you, Laura. And thank you again to all of you, all of our speakers, uh, Sasha Vlasov, Laura Chapman, Kettle Peterson, and Matt McKenna for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.